For almost 300 years, China underwent an unprecedented period of stability and prosperity. This dynasty catapulted China onto the world stage as a genuine global power. And it all started with a peasant orphan boy. How's it young stashes? I'm Dr. Jakob Seidnot. This is Stashy, my trusted companion in all things history. And welcome to the historian Stash, home of South African high school history. This week is the start of your high school history journey. I know how tough high school can be. You tend to remember your high school days quite vividly as an adult, not only because of the lacquer times, but also because of the not so lacquer times. We don't have the capacity. So I'm here to tell you that I understand your fears and I know what you're going through because I've been through it already and I want you to have a better high school experience than what I had. Now, while I can't help you with your overall high school experience, I can help you to get good marks for history. There's no need for you to panic. Just relax on them. But besides great grades, my wish for you is that by the end of the year, you'll look at the world from a completely different perspective than the one you started with at the beginning of this journey. So on that note, let's hoy with topic one. We start off by looking at the world around 1600. So I want you to imagine yourself as a time traveler. I'm back from the future. Great Scott. And you decide to travel back in time to the year 1600. What do you think would life be like? What would you see? Who would have been the major global powers at the time? Now, you might be asking, why do we need to know about what was going on in the world at around 1600? And the short answer is, there's a lot going on at that time. I, there's a lot going on here. You see, all over the world, different empires and kingdoms were either starting to develop or were busy consolidating their power. In Europe, the Middle Ages had ended and the 1600s was a period of enlightenment and expansion. This would lead to the establishment of various trading routes and colonies that would change the trajectory of world history forever. In India, the Mughal Empire was extending its influence in the Indian Ocean region. In Africa, the Songhai Empire had already established trade routes that brought the merchants from the Middle East, Europe and other parts of Africa. Timbuktu was a thriving commercial and cultural hub where Arab, Italian and Jewish merchants all gathered for trade. But this week, we're heading to China. China! 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 By 1600, a powerful Chinese empire had already expanded its influence to Europe and the east coast of Africa with Chinese maritime expeditions plotting early maps of the world and extending trade and influence along Asian sea routes, as well as sharing knowledge with early European traders and travelers. This empire was known as the Ming Dynasty. Ming? You pay me any dollar for war! It all started way, way back in the mid 14th century. Up until 1368, 
China was still controlled by the Mongols in what was known as the Yuan Dynasty. In Mongolian law, indigenous Chinese people, especially the Han, were considered to be of a lower class. So, whereas non-Mongolian foreigners such as Marco Polo and Ahmad Fanakati were welcomed as patrons in Yuan China, the same could not be said of the Chinese locals themselves. In fact, in many instances, Chinese peasants were enslaved in large numbers, had their lands confiscated, and were excluded from government positions. Not cool, bruh. But during the 1340s, a series of natural disasters and forced conscription of Han peasants led to internal class tension. A lot of the Chinese oaks were tuning Enough is enough! And various rebel groups began to assemble and prepare for rebellion. This, my friends, this is our rebellion. One of the main leaders of these rebel groups was Zhu Yuanzang. Now, this China came from humble beginnings. Not only was he a Han, he was also an orphan who found refuge at a monastery. The story goes that the Yuan militia destroyed the monastery in an attempt to stop a rebellion. This caused Yuan Zhang to swear vengeance against the Yuan dynasty. I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. So he took his time and in 1352 he joined the rebels, later joining the epically named Red Turban's rebel force. It's dumb. It's not dumb. It's just dumb. Why is it dumb? I don't know. In 1356, Yuan Zhang and his army conquered Nanjing, which became his base of operations and later the capital of the Ming Dynasty during his reign. By 1368, the Yuan Dynasty had all but collapsed due to internal strife. That same year, Zhu Yuan Zhang launched one last rebellion and captured the Yuan capital, Khan Balik, which is present-day Beijing. Yuan Zhang's victory marked the official end of Mongolian control over China. And so, Zhu Yuan Zhang began the Ming Dynasty and adopted the title of Hongwu Emperor and changed his name to Emperor Taizu. But we'll continue to call him Yuan Zhang for the sake of not confusing anyone. Now, out of interest, the word Ming means bright. By 1382, almost 15 years after he took power, Yuan Zhang finally reunified China. But his rule was despotic. He eliminated the posts of Prime Minister and Central Chancellor so that he could wield absolute authority as Emperor. He prohibited eunuchs from participating in government. I've been a palace eunuch since I was 9 years old. How would I become a eunuch? Well, they cut off your testicles. Ooh and appointed civilian officials to control military affairs. Yun Zhang's reign set the tone for the rest of the Ming rulers. Now importantly, the Ming dynasty had the most effective central bureaucracy in the world. The Ming emperors were autocratic rulers, which meant that they had complete power over all aspects of life in the empire. This meant that one dude controlled absolutely everything that happened in China, purely based on his birthright. Whoa, this is heavy. Because of all this control, government structures worked the way that the emperor wanted them to work. So the civil service system was perfected. Officials could only enter top levels of the bureaucracy once they passed the government examination. During Yuan Zhang's reign, an office called the censorate or Yu Shitai, was made separate to the government. They investigated official cases of corruption and misconduct. So they were like the Ming version of the Zondo Commission. Just causing an unnecessary irritation. A key feature of the Ming dynasty was that there was no prime minister. The emperor took full control over the government and was only assisted by a grand secretariat, also known as a Negi. During the rule of the Yongli Emperor and onwards, the eunuchs made a comeback as advisors for the Emperor. 
Why all, why all the genital mutilation? Well, you get to keep them. I always keep mine close at hand. Would you like to see? They held a high position in the bureaucratic rank. However, the advisor's influence grew so much that by the 16th century, Ming emperors were often dominated by them. This often led to internal squabbling and indecision up until the end of the Ming era. But the Ming governmental structure outlasted the Ming dynasty itself. In fact, it lasted up until 1911 when China's imperial system was abolished. Now, from the beginning of Yuan Zhang's reign, strict military discipline was enforced and the army was reorganized to incorporate what would become known as the Brocade Guards. These guards operated alongside spies and secret agents to eliminate corrupt officials. The punishment that was dished out against these corrupt officials included tattooing, the severing of organs, and castration. Ooh. Imagine if that was the punishment for corrupt officials here in South Africa. Yer. However, near the end of Yuan Zhang's reign, these punishments were outlawed in favor of corporal punishment and flogging, which is still pretty harsh. In 1380, Yuan Zhang changed the legal code in such a way so that his power could not be challenged in court. So for all intents and purposes, he became a despotic dictator. However, as we'll see in later episodes, this was pretty normal all over the world back then. Also in 1380, the palace guard launched an internal investigation which lasted for 14 years. During this time, it's estimated that a whopping 30,000 executions were carried out in the name of the emperor. Yuan Zhang also launched a series of land and tax reforms. Contrary to popular belief, women in Ming China could exert some influence, albeit in a limited capacity. They had the ability to become property owners if they were affluent enough. They also had access to literature when it was widely published. Ming society, especially towards the end of the dynasty, seemed to be more accepting of ideas that challenged the patriarchy. In the 17th century, an anthology of Chinese poetry included poems from as many as 1,000 women. In addition, the writer Li Yu Who are you? You. No, not me, you. Yes, I am you. was one of the early vocal feminists, arguing that women should be equal to men. Just answer the damn questions. Who are you? I have told you. Are you deaf? No, you is blind. I'm not blind, you blind. That is what I just said. But this was only on the surface. In reality, Women in Ming China were expected to stay at home and birth children. Male children were more important than female children, and it was common practice to actually kill female babies at birth. What's wrong with you? Officially, this practice was discouraged, but was still practiced widely. Status was strongly connected to class. This meant that your class depended on your position in society. Therefore, rural peasant women worked in the same conditions as men. On the other hand, urban peasant women were employed as weavers and seamstresses. Upper class women were subjected to the painful practice of foot binding in an attempt to keep their feet small and feminine. When women's feet were bound, their bones would often break and they could only make small strides when walking. In 1406, Emperor Yongli changed the capital of China from Nanjing to Beijing. Yongli ordered the construction of an imperial palace complex in Beijing called the Forbidden City, which remains the world's largest palace to this day. In 1420, the Forbidden City was occupied by the imperial court. Beijing became a cultural hub where different types of craftsmanship took place. It was also the main bureaucratic and military center, while towns like Nanjing became famous for their social life and festivals. Okay, nobody parties but me. Yes. And we party. No. Yeah, just Rod. Yes. And me. No. 
Ornamental carvings from wood, porcelain, ivory and jade were some of the features during this time. Decorative ceramics that used different techniques were a trademark. Porcelain was one of the Ming Dynasty's best exports. Cultural achievements of the Ming Dynasty were characterized by a conservative and inward-looking attitude. Urban culture grew as Chinese cities expanded. Literacy examinations were re-established. So all of this led to an increase in the literacy rate. Consequently, more people were reading and writing. Books became affordable for commoners. During the Ming Dynasty, traditional Chinese drama made a comeback. The musical theater forms of Chonggi and Kung Ku were implemented. These forms were adapted to form fuller length operas. Furthermore, painting traditions of the Ming Dynasty can be categorized according to the Tarati painting of the Wu school and professional academic painting of the Zi school. Individual artists became popular during this time, giving their own unique style in their work. I'd like to try your Wu-Tang style. Let's begin then. China's link to Central and Western Asia and Europe was through the establishment of a series of ancient overland trade routes that stretched over a whopping 6,400 kilometers. This network of trade routes is known as the Silk Road. The Silk Road was established in around 130 BCE but was shut down by the Ottoman Empire in 1453. However, trading routes via the sea were also established. Chinese junks were unique ships that were used from as early as the 5th century. These vessels had two predominant features, a yulo oar for steering and stiffened sails supported by bamboo battens. The yulo rudder allowed ships to steer and turn without having to take the rudder out of the water. Legend suggests that this design was inspired by the way that fish use their tails to thrust themselves forward. Junks were huge with a length of 122 meters and a width of 46 meters. China's first imperial treasure fleets were commissioned by the Mongols during the Yuan dynasty. The Chinese hoped to discover new lands and establish new trading partners. They often returned with exotic animals, spices, ivory and prisoners of war. During the Ming dynasty, Emperor Yongli invested a large amount of money into extending the fleet. The imperial fleet reached its peak in the 15th century under the leadership of a Muslim eunuch called Admiral Zheng Wei. He conducted seven maritime expeditions. Yongli instructed Zheng Wei to explore the oceans in search of new lands and trading valuable goods. Between 1405 and 1433, representatives were sent to other countries to ask for tribute in money or goods to show that they recognized the power of the Chinese Empire. Zheng Wei's fleet reached a total of 37 countries, expanding China's influence along Asian sea routes. China's trade potential and peaceful voyages left a mark on the countries that Zheng Wei visited, demonstrating China's trade potential and naval strength. But now although Zheng Wei is often depicted as an ambassador of friendship, some contemporary historians suggest that his voyages were actually attempts to colonize China's neighbors. Let me repeat this. Yep, that's right. There's evidence to suggest that these voyages were precursor expeditions aimed at finding suitable territories to colonize. The aim was to establish tributary or vassal states in the east and expand China's domination. By doing so, China would be able to establish a Pax Ming or a period of peace in East Asia under the rule of the Ming emperors. So Zheng Wei's fleets were accompanied by soldiers who established military depots and outposts all over Southeast Asia, allowing them to control the waterways. Now Chinese technology was also far more advanced than anything in Europe at the time. Even long before the Ming Dynasty, the Chinese had already invented things like the magnetic compass, 
paper, the wheelbarrow, suspension bridges, gunpowder, porcelain, and the mechanical clock. That was made in China! The most commonly traded items from Zheng Wei's feet were silks and spices. They used a star chart and magnetic compasses to navigate the oceans. This technology allowed for more accurate travel towards their destinations. Zheng Wei departed for his final voyage in 1431 and visited Indochina, which is present-day Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia, Thailand and Vietnam, as well as Java, Sri Lanka, India, Iran, the Red Sea, as well as Zanzibar off the East African coast. This voyage marked the last of the Chinese fleet, and after it returned in 1433, China ended its expansionist policies. Despite this, foreigners were still traveling to China, keen on developing trade relations. By 1514, Portuguese merchants had reached China. Within the next 35 years, a trading station was established at Macau on the south coast of China. By 1557, China's tribute trade system shifted towards maritime trade. This meant that China focused on producing goods for export and allowed a European presence in their empire. In the following years, Ming-China's mercantile relationship with the West grew stronger. Why is everything here made in China? Because China is always number one! Number one in what? In child labor? During the first 50 years of the Ming Dynasty, the Mongols were driven north to what is known today as Mongolia. Following this, the northern border was under constant threat. After Emperor Yongli died in 1424, the Ming Dynasty became extremely vulnerable to outside invasion. In 1449, Mongol-speaking Oirat peoples invaded China. The emperor at the time, Ying Zong, led an unsuccessful counterattack. This failure caused a shift from expansionist policy to a defensive frontier strategy. Ying Zong's China lacked the military resources to defend itself against the Mongols. And so, in 1474, General Jiguang oversaw construction of the best known and most preserved section of the famous Great Wall of China, which had been started during the Qin Dynasty back in 220 BCE. We're building a beautiful wall. The Great Wall was strengthened and maintained throughout the Ming Dynasty. Did you know? The Great Wall of China is the largest construction ever built by humans. The complete route is over 20,000 kilometers, stretching from the sea in the east to the west desert in northern China. But there were also struggles with groups from other nationalities. To the south of China, early Ming emperors attempted to invade northern Vietnam, but were unsuccessful. The boundary lines between China and Vietnam remained the same, and Ming emperors stopped their attempts to push further south. The nomadic Jokhan people, who would later become the Manchu, Bless you. occupied the territory to the northeast of China and placed pressure on the Ming armies until they got the territory right up to the Great Wall. Meanwhile, across the ocean, Japanese and Chinese pirates initiated coastal raids. But these alone did not threaten the control of the Ming dynasty. During the late 16th century, the bureaucratic structures of the Ming dynasty began to weaken. Some internal factors contributed to this decline. These factors include conflict within government, interference by palace eunuchs, factional fighting between civil officials, as well as weakening imperialism. It's argued that many of the emperors of the Yingzong were dominated by their advisors causing the emperors to lose track of many important issues. In a system where the emperor exerts absolute power and control, you can't have multiple influential advisors with differing opinions in his ear. This was bound to cause confusion and infighting, eventually leading to the slow collapse of the dynasty. In addition, rebellions arose to oppose high taxation and an unpopular government. In April 1644, rebel peasant leader Li Zicheng took control of Beijing. This caused the Chongzhen Emperor, 
the last Ming Emperor, to commit suicide. Death to Ming! Li Zicheng then tried to negotiate the surrender of Wu Sangui, a powerful Ming commander in the north. But when Li Zicheng's forces were on the verge of defeating him, Wu Zangui accepted help from the Manchu and opened up the gates of the Great Wall allowing the Manchu to defeat Li Zicheng's army at the Battle of Shanghai Pass. This proved to be a fatal mistake by Wu Zangui because the Manchus swept across China, taking control of Beijing. The Manchus then installed their own emperor, Huang Taiji, and so began a new era, the Qing Dynasty which would last for more than 250 years until 1911 with the abolishment of imperial rule following the Xinhai Revolution. But that is a story for another day. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you haven't done so already, please go slot the like and subscribe buttons on YouTube so that you get the next episode hot off the virtual presses. Until next time, from Stashy and myself, stay Stashy.